Right, well, a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today to mark International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. I'm Marie Stadros, I'm the Director of the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, and I'm based at the Institute of Development Studies um, here in the UK. And uh, joining us uh, today to mark this very important day um, by order of appearance uh, is Professor Melissa Leach, who is the Director of the Institute of Development Studies and has a multitude of publications on gender sensitive approaches to transformative change. Um, and um, we will, we're also uh, very, very delighted to be uh, joined by Professor Karima Banoun, the UN Special Rapporteur for Cultural Rights and a long standing champion of women's rights, and a distinguished professor of law, and uh, Martin uh, Lu Luther King uh, Junior Hall Research Scholar at the University of California. Davis uh, uh, School of Law, and whose book, Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here, I would strongly recommend. It's a wonderful book, and um, it speaks to a lot of the issues that resonate with um, the work that uh, we will be launching today. I'm also very, very delighted um, to welcome our panelists, uh, Mariam Kanwar and Sadiqa Sultan from El Ho'i Foundation. They will be presenting the first paper on, on the findings of working with Hazara Shia women in Belarusistan. Mariam has been working extensively in human development for over 10 years. Um, she is currently leading the creed work in Pakistan with a fantastic team um, um, in El Ho'i and also in Pakistan. Sadiqa Sultan is a peace builder, development practitioner and activist. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Otago, New Zealand and has a master's degree in peace and conflict studies. Um, she has uh, facilitated many um, sessions on um, uh, countering uh, violence and building peace. And uh, she is the first ever young, she established the, she led, or led the first ever young women leadership conference of Pakistan. Um, we have two uh, panelists who are joining us in an unconventional way today. The first is Seema, who led the paper and the work with uh, Hindu women in the Sindh province um, and uh, on account of a number of sensitivities she could not join us today but she is delighted that Aisha Khan um, is going to be presenting her work and Aisha Khan is part of um, this program of work on the intersection of gender, religious marginality and socioeconomic exclusion. Um, Aisha Khan is the director and senior researcher at the collective for social science research in Pakistan. She is also a pioneering figure in the feminist movement in Pakistan with over 20 years of sustained championing of women's rights. She is the author of a book I also highly, highly recommend. It's called The Women's Movement in Pakistan, Activism, Islam and Democracy. And in addition to being a partner on the Creed program, um, she is also engaged with another research, IDS research program called Action for Empowerment and Accountability. At the moment, she is studying the impact of COVID-19 on civic spaces in Pakistan. I'm also extremely delighted uh, to welcome um, another uh, key uh, author in um, this set of papers that, um, uh, that we're launching today, who again is joining us on in an unconventional way. Uh, Dr. MK uh, was the author um, and uh, principal investigator in working with uh, the Ahmadiyya community, working with Pakistani Ahmadiyya women. Uh, he is a, a leader in the Ahmadiyya community um, and currently works in an international organization. Um, he will be joining us uh, in voice uh, because of, again, security, and sense, again, issues to do with sensitivities, uh, issues to do with security reasons. Um, so he will be able to take everyone's questions, but uh, we have anonymized his name and he will be joining us um, in an audio form only. Um, then uh, last but uh, definitely not least among the panelists is Naumana Suleiman, uh, who is a human rights professional researcher and trainer. And uh, uh, Naumana is with Minority Rights Work, uh, sorry, Naumana works with Minority Rights Group International and she uh, leads a lot of the minority rights group work in Pakistan. And Naumana is the first ever minority woman to serve as a, an advisor to UN Women Pakistan. 
Um, and after uh, you will hear from these amazing panelists, we're extremely delighted um, to have with us uh, serving as discussant, uh, Mike Babcock, who is the civil society team leader uh, for the Inclusive Societies Department at the FCDO. Uh, Mike has worked in international development for over 30 years and uh, joined um, uh, the Department for International Development in the year 2000 and has worked on aid effectiveness, governance, accountability, and civil society development. And of course, for us as a creed, uh, Mike has been um, um, in, an incredible um, uh, support to us. He has accompanied us along our journey from the outset. He has advised us. He has uh, just provided invaluable support uh, for us um, um, from the outset. So very grateful that uh, Mike is also with us as uh, discussant. Um, so uh, you will also in the um, in the papers that uh, uh, co colleagues from IDS have made available in the chat function. This is the link to the four papers. It is a mighty read. Um, I think this will make for joyful reading over your weekend because it's over 320 pages of people's voices, people's stories, people's anecdote, very uh, comprehensively presented evidence um, on um, which you will get snippets of um, in our event today, because we obviously want to hear you and we want to have enough time for discussion. So uh, just a little bit of a grounding on what this is about. Um, and then uh, I will uh, pass on to Melissa. So um, as we mentioned, today we are commemorating the day um, for the elimination of all forms of violence against women. And the groups that we are talking about today, where there is an intersection of um, religious marginality, they're members of religious minorities, uh, but they also happen to be socioeconomically excluded on account of class. Um, but they also happen in many cases, this intersects with caste, and in other cases, it also intersects with ethnicity, um, has meant that in many cases, they have fallen um, in between the cracks of violence, of discussions about violence, um, along with several agendas. Um, they have, first of all, um, fallen uh, in between um, the cracks of international develop development policy. Barely have I seen any mention of the Hazara Shia women Tajikistan in any political economy analysis. Um, rarely have we uh, heard about the everyday fears that uh, Hindu and Christian women um, in Pakistan uh, face, um, especially when they're living in uh, areas that are characterized by socioeconomic exclusion, um, in the discourses about women and women's security and, and, and conflict. Um, Rarely have we also uh, seen this in international feminist discourses, where again, intersectionality has become a very powerful catch cry to talk about uh, being aware of diversity, but where unfortunately, as, uh, as much as so much progress in talking about uh, women uh, of color, uh, women of different ethnic backgrounds, uh, women with disability, women in rural areas, we have not progressed. Um, when we talk about minority women um, in many of the contexts in which we work. And I know the term is contentious and we deal with the problematics of the term, but the reality is that even if you are not um, practicing a faith, but you just happen to have the face uh, uh, or the associated, in other words, that you're not covered in a particular way, the name, um, the, uh, the name that tells of your religious affiliation, even if you're not a practicing person. The reality is there are many identifiers where if you just happen to be affiliated to a religious minority and you happen to be a woman and you happen to be poor, those kind of intersections uh, mean a lot. And they mean a lot in terms of everyday experiences of violence that people would normally associate with the kind of violence that we see in conflict uh, contexts, such as abductions. But this is something that is feared on an everyday basis in non-conflict um, settings. So um, it's actually making the voices and experiences visible. We are not here um, bringing out these experiences with the view of creating a hierarchy of suffering. This is not our intention at all. But the intention is to make visible, invisible forms of marginalization, 
of intersecting vulnerabilities that have fallen in between the cracks that we haven't uh, talked about, discussed enough. And also, I think if for every single abducted Hindu or Christian woman in Pakistan, we had a feminist uh, petition, we had a feminist march, we had a feminist mobilization, oh my gosh, we would be having an event almost every day of the year, or perhaps even more than one event. So it's also about making that link between making visible the issues and our need to act um, in these issues, whether it's in research, whether it's in policy engagement, or whether it's in mobilization, or whether it's even in um, the legal arena. So I will, I will leave it up to you. And of course, our panelists will have a lot of policy recommendations they make. And then we can talk together about collectively in solidarity, how we can think about not just making visible the invisible, but making it um, um, an issue that is taken forward um, in concrete, useful action, but that is also action that speaks to the agenda of people on the ground. So it's not one that is disconnected from people's priorities. Um, very, very quickly, the last thing I want to say is who did, who did the research and how the research is done for us is even more important than um, the specific micro uh, research findings. Because for us, uh, it is about the legitimacy uh, of the, 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 the researchers in the eyes of the people. Um, and for us, that is why we were so privileged and delighted and honored um, that the people who are presenting their work today were from these communities. Um, and had legitimacy in the eyes of the communities, had the community's trust. Um, secondly, how we do the research is for us also so important. Um, for the purposes of making visible, invisible voices and experiences and stories, for us doing questionnaires was out of question. Um, we wanted um, the communities, which are the heart of um, our um, inquiry, um, to be the ones that have a role in the co-creation of the agenda. What is important for them? In what order and why? And that is why participatory methodologies is so, so important. Um, and I won't go any further because the details of the methodologies um, are explained in detail. But I think it does actually have to do with the, the bigger vision of, um, again, this is not about ghettoizing a certain group because this, this work that we have done in Pakistan, we're doing cross country, and we'll come back to this later. But it is about how we see the world. And um, I want to pass on to Melissa to um, share with us a bit about um, how uh, participatory methodologies, intersecting inequalities, agency, um, and so forth fits into the a broader agenda um, about how we engage with injustice. Okay. So, Maurice, thank you. So um, as director of IDS, I'm absolutely delighted to join Maurice and her colleagues in the CREED programme, which is one of our really most important flagship research and action programmes at IDS, and welcoming our wonderful speakers and all participants and audiences to this real landmark event on this extremely special day. So I think um, as those who will have had the chance to look at the papers, and as you will hear, um, our speakers make clear that women, whether they belong to the Ahmadiyya, the Hindu, the Christian or the Hazara Shia minorities in Pakistan, are experiencing power and powerlessness in ways that are shaped by multiple factors, by their religious affiliation, by their gender, by their class, by their geographic positioning, and in some cases by their ethnicity and their caste as well. And I'm really looking forward to hearing them elaborate on the details of their work and on the ways in which discrimination on the basis of gender and religious affiliation is an embodied and everyday experience. I think we will hear too that understanding the realities of women who are experiencing religious inequalities absolutely doesn't mean that inequalities are kind of like building blocks with one sitting on top of the other. And it doesn't mean either that their experience of inequalities is taking away from their, their agency, their own abilities and capabilities to resist or challenge or cope, or in fact, change their realities. 
What it does mean um, is understanding this really complex interplay between many factors which influence their vulnerability to particular forms of targeting and which also then influence the ways in which they're able to exert their agency and manifest their capabilities. So this is really important to, to IDS as well. For many decades, we at the Institute have been committed to making visible such intersecting inequalities experienced by people on the margins. And the fact that Creed is doing this so very effectively makes it, it's one of the reasons why it's kind of a jewel in our, in our crown at IDS, to use that metaphor. But this kind of approach was also central a couple of years ago when we led the World Social Science Report on challenging inequalities, which we did with the International Science Council, where we argued that religious inequalities along with other forms of cultural, social and political inequality had been really badly underplayed in the de broader debate about inequality, where, which tends to be dominated by economic inequalities, those vertical inequalities of class. Yet all of these in practice intersect and they need a much more, as we argued, multidimensional and integrated kind of attention in research and policy and action. And this kind of commitment is also manifest in our latest IDS strategy, which we launched in June this year, Transforming Knowledge, Transforming Lives, which talks about our commitment to reduce extreme inequities through research and action that focuses on understanding and countering the drivers of extreme inequity, marginalization and exclusion. And as Maurice has already said, how we do this research is as important as the research findings themselves. Um, our strategy also talks about our long-standing commitment at the Institute to participatory methodologies and indeed to amplifying those and deepening them in the coming period. Um, we're really committed um, and would seek to prioritize research that is collaborative across disciplines, across sectors, across communities to bring about progressive change. And we're really delighted in that context that through Creed, we've been able to partner with people like our panelists today who have brought a wealth of knowledge and experience, not just to Creed, but actually to help us as IDS more broadly help to achieve these, these global strategic aims. So, um, I'll stop there because we're really all here to hear from our fantastic range of panelists um, who will present these papers, discuss how to redress the impacts of discrimination on the grounds of religion or belief as part of this broader agenda to tackle poverty and exclusion and promote women's well-being and empowerment. And what more important day on which to do this than this International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. But before we hear from the panelists themselves, of course, I'm particularly delighted now, finally, to introduce our keynote speaker, Karima Benune. So Karima, over to you. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Leach, for that very kind introduction. I really want to thank the organizers, IDS, Creed, Professor Maurice Tadros. I'm so pleased to meet her finally in cyberspace uh, for inviting me. And as I said to Professor Tadros, I really unfortunately didn't have time to do this because I have my next UN report due, but I'm so thrilled that I was able to do it because I was just so inspired by the briefs. So it's a real privilege to be here with you at this digital convening about discrimination and violence against women of religious minority background in Pakistan. It's a particular privilege to be able to gather in cyberspace in these challenging times when, of course, so many others who live on the other side of the digital divide in the world uh, cannot do that. And I have to say, I am especially honored uh, to be sharing the floor with my very distinguished fellow speakers and the authors of the studies we will be discussing. I have to congratulate them most sincerely for carrying out this work, which is never easy in ordinary times. Uh, and 
particularly difficult, I'm sure, in the times of the pandemic. And I really salute uh, the participatory methodology whereby they are helping to bring us the voices of uh, women who are members of religious minorities in Pakistan so that we can hear uh, those voices mediated through their research. This is, to me, really a significant contribution to our understanding of the human rights challenges uh, facing women who are members of religious minorities everywhere. And I cannot think of a better way than to mark this the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women than to be here with you for this event. Uh, as a backdrop for our specific discussion about Pakistan, I think it's important to remember that these are perilous times for women's rights everywhere, uh, and that we have seen an increase in violence against women worldwide, while so many women have been locked down during the pandemic with their abusers. And as my colleague, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women noted in a statement today, which I've put in the chat, I put the link to it in the chat, um, and this is a statement endorsed by myself and many other other UN experts because of its importance. She said, as the world grapples with the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and its negative impact on women, a pandemic of femicide and gender-based violence against women is taking the lives of women and girls everywhere. And I think it's so important to remember that global context for our more specific discussion today. So there really is uh, so much for us to be talking about. But in my brief time, I'm going to to say a few words uh, about some of the topics that I was asked to address. Uh, first, the importance of recognizing what one of the excellent briefs we're talking about today labeled as multi-layered marginalization that women from religious minorities may face. The second topic I will address is Pakistan's recent re-election to the UN Human Rights Council, uh, the body that appointed me as special rapporteur, and specifically how we might see that re-election as an opportunity for improvements in its human rights record on the issues under discussion here today. Uh, and finally, uh, the very important need to challenge laws that allow gender-based violence, including against minority women, to go unchecked under the rubric of religion or culture. Uh, and before I touch on each of those topics in turn, let me just say a little bit about what a UN Special Rapporteur is and does and about the cultural rights that I work on. So UN Special Rapporteurs are independent experts uh, who don't work for the UN system. We are appointed by the Human Rights Council, which is a political body in the UN system, and we report to the council, uh, but we are meant to be independent voices uh, and we don't, uh, we're don't we not paid by the UN. And I think that independence is incredibly important. Um, I specifically have the mandate to work on cultural rights, which are also guaranteed in international human rights law. Uh, and cultural rights, uh, I think, are something that cause some anxiety because of the way that claims of culture may have been misused. Uh, so I want to set out that in my vision and the vision of my predecessor as rapporteur, Farida Shahid, a very noted Pakistani feminist scholar, um, cultural rights are vital for women. These include women's rights to have access to and participate participate in all aspects of cultural life and practices without discrimination as guaranteed by international law. And I have to stress that this includes women's rights to actively engage in deciding which cultural traditions, values, or practices are to be kept which are to be modified or which are to be discarded because they no longer comport with our understanding of human dignity. So the cultural rights of women are important in and of themselves, but also as a gateway to their enjoyment of all other human rights. And I think diverse strategies, including those working within religion and culture and in a cultural rights paradigm may be useful in defending women's human rights from the global challenges and these diverse strategies should be recognized. Uh, for example, I, I was really struck uh, and I noted this in one of my reports that after an attack by Daesh in February, 2017 at a Sufi shrine in Pakistan, which killed over 70 people taking part in a Sufi ritual, the dancer Shima Kirmani 
from Karachi went to that site and performed uh, a dance, a traditional dance for local people, notwithstanding the security risks, to send a message of hope. And I found that so inspiring. And I said this in the Human Rights Council as well, the international community, all of us, should show as much courage and creativity as women like her and stand with women members of religious minorities everywhere against the violence and discrimination they may face and do that in a range of creative ways. And I think one of the first things we have to do is to learn from scholarship like that that we're discussing today and recognize the specificity and the complexity of the situations of women members of religious minorities rather than homogenizing the experience of minorities or taking the experience of some male members of those minorities to reflect the challenges faced by women in the same groups. Um, and in my own work, I have tried to reflect on the internally diverse nature of any human group. In my first report to the Human Rights Council back in 2016, I noted that it was important to query the precise meaning of terms like community in the realm of cultural rights. Uh, these are terms which we often use without definition and are seeming to suggest uh, homogeneity, that the experience of everyone within that so-called community is uh, the same. And I think this really can contribute to erasing and even legitimizing situations of oppression within groups that we have to remember. And this is another reason why I was so inspired by uh, the research briefs uh, for this event today. Uh, I think that this very specific research goes a long way to challenging some of the harmful generalizations uh, that can be made uh, in this area. I was especially struck in reading the briefs by the different perspectives on which are the greatest challenges as expressed by women and men in the religious minorities uh, surveyed. Uh, and I was particularly struck that women in at least some of the minorities uh, that were covered were much more likely to stress uh, obstacles to accessing education than men in the same groups. And I think that's something we really need to pay attention to. I also wanted to say, given my own work in the past, uh, how important it is that a number of the briefs, including those on Hazara and Ahmadiyya women, uh, emphasize the importance of combating fundamentalism, extremism, and terrorism for guaranteeing the human rights of women members of minorities. And I have to say, I strongly endorse these recommendations, which I think unfortunately are not always understood by feminists and feminist scholars uh, everywhere. I think that diverse forms of fundamentalism fundamentalism and extremism everywhere in the world today are significant challenges to women's human rights uh, that we have to confront. Otherwise, we have no chance of meeting uh, the sustainable development goal of gender equality by 2030. I was also struck by the number of recommendations that address the need to protect the cultural rights of women of uh, members of religious minorities, um, including many of the things that I work on, their ability to express their cultural and religious identities, such as through dress or through the celebration of religious festivals without fear of discrimination or harassment. And these are also critically important recommendations, which I endorse. This brings me uh, quickly to the second issue that I was asked to address, and that is what it means that Pakistan, uh, the state that is the context of our discussion for today, has been reelected in October uh, to the Human Rights Council. Um, and I think it's important to remember that the UN Human Rights Council is a political body made up of states chosen by other states, 47 uh, states. It's the highest UN body in the field of human rights. And we can never let states forget that the General Assembly resolution that created the council specifically says that members elected to the council shall uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. And to me, this says that this is a critical moment for Pakistan to take effective action on the human rights recommendations made in the briefs that we are talking about today. And I'd like to point out that a number of the recommendations 
uh, made by our colleagues here were also made by the UN's CEDAW Committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women to Pakistan back in uh, March 2020. And the committee also identified uh, the issue of discriminatory treatment uh, and violence against women members of minority groups in the country as a matter of deep concern uh, and made a number of recommendations in this regard, um, including the need for better data gathering on intersecting forms of discrimination and an action plan on violence against women. And I think it is a critical moment for us uh, to push uh, in a friendly way the government of Pakistan to uphold those commitments that really go hand in hand with its re-election uh, to the council. And finally, let me just say uh, a few words quickly in closing about the need to challenge laws that allow gender-based violence, including against women members of religious minorities. So those kinds of changes, those kinds of legislative changes are critically important. Cultures are dynamic. They are not static. They change over time. Each tradition and practice that is identified as cultural, uh, and that's always uh, sort of contested, uh, has to stand the test of universal human rights and show its capacity to build and maintain human dignity to remain legitimate. And we have to remember that yesterday, slavery and racial apartheid were also justified using cultural arguments, something that we entirely reject today. So such transformations over time are perfectly uh, normal. Normal. Culture is not an acceptable excuse for failing to change laws that facilitate gender-based violence, uh, and reform to change those laws is actually required by international law. And this allows me to be very clear, and I think that's my most important job as Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights. Cultural rights are not the same thing as cultural relativism. They do not justify discrimination, discriminatory laws, or violence. They are part of the universal human rights framework. States themselves have actually rejected cultural relativism officially, uh, and they have reiterated their commitment to universal human rights for all in standards like the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action of 1993, in which states themselves reaffirmed that it is their duty, regardless of their political, economic, and cultural systems, specifically they said cultural systems, to promote and protect all human rights. And the very brave work of the researchers on these studies under discussion here today and the concerns raised by those they interviewed remind us yet again on this international day for the elimination of violence against women of the very urgent need for all states, including Pakistan, to make those words from the Vienna Declaration into a lived reality for women, including women members of religious minorities everywhere. Thank you very much and I'm so looking forward to the rest of the event. Thank you so much, Professor Banoon. This has just been um, a tour de force for us. I think this is raising issues that um, touch on every single uh, one of these uh, inquiries that has been undertaken and for all the other work that we're doing in the other countries as well. Um, thank you for also reminding us of the uses and abuses of the term culture in different ways, which we also see happening um, um, in, 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 in all contexts in which we work. This has been a wonderful uh, keynote address to us and, and we're very grateful. Um, so uh, now we move on to just to sort of a, say a very quick footnote for those that don't, that I very quickly um, skimmed over what is Creed. Um, Creed, is a, Creed is a consortium, it's convened by IDS, but it is based on a consortium of partners that includes Il Khoi Foundation from which we will hear very shortly now, it includes minority rights group, which we're so privileged to have Naumana with us from today. It also includes Rif Semi that has just joined us. Um, but it also in includes at least another 50 organizations um, and individuals around the world with whom we work and partner. Some of them, um, we are so privileged to be able to share their names openly and some of them we work with, but um, a little bit um, sometimes next to the wall, sometimes inside the wall. Um, so uh, the, the, just the, the, the com it's, it's a large program with lots of people in it. And, and on that note, I'm just so um, delighted to uh, welcome our first panelists um, who uh, co-authored uh, the paper on the Hazara Shia women with Jafar uh, Mirza, who, uh, who also 
uh, wrote the paper, but um, I think Mariam Kanwar and uh, Sadika Sultan um, decided to co-present uh, the findings with us. So over to you, thank you. I was on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maris, and to the entire Cree team. This is indeed a great opportunity and a platform uh, to represent the plight of Shia Hazara women whose voices are often unheard and missing from the discourse. Uh, I will, because of the shortage of time, I will just quickly, uh, briefly talk about some background that why this research was needed and why we chose Shia Hazara women and what are the overall argument of our research. While our grind, uh, ground researcher Sadiqa, who herself comes from the Hazara Shia community in Quetta and has experienced the violence firsthand, will talk about the findings, nuances on internal contradictions and everyday experiences of the community, specifically the women. Uh, I, I have to say, which Maris has already explained, that you know we have uh, conducted our research using participatory ranking methodology in an uncon unconventional way, which, uh, way, which Satka will explain further. Uh, so before I share the findings, just let me briefly share the context of Hazara community. Shia Hazara community are one of the most persecuted religious minorities in Pakistan, populated in Quetta, capital of Balochistan in the southwestern region. The present population of Hazara Shias in Quetta is the result of migrations from Afghanistan since 1880. Although the violence against Shias in Pakistan dates back to 1979, it has intensified since 2001. Hazaras, due to their distinct uh, Mongolian features that distinguishes them from non-Hazara Shias are the easy target. And since 2001, according to reports, uh, around 1,600 have been killed in anti-Shia targeted attacks. Around 70,000 Hazaras have been migrated to other parts of the world, and those who could not migrate are forced to ghettoize themselves in two Hazara communities in Quetta, Mariabad and Hazara town. Our research centers on Hazara women, as most of the existing lit literature about the persecution focuses on Hazara men or Hazara community in general. Through our research, we have tried to understand the vulnerability of Hazara women within the larger Shia community in Pakistan and how the intersections of class, religious and ethnic affiliation and gender aggravates the marginalization forced, uh, faced by the poor Hazara women. Having said that, understanding the sensitive nature of our research and the diversity of the Hazara Shia community, I would, I would also say that our findings do not necessarily reflect the entire Hazara community. Our research has been taken out of engaging 44 participants through six FGDs and eight women interviewees. We have engaged the lower strata of the Hazara community, including families of the mortared, uh, those who have lost their loved ones, women-headed families, women who are engaged in, their small, in either small-scale businesses or sports. The reason for focusing on this specific strata is that these community members are more vulnerable than the rest of the community and are less represented in any of the studies of the sort. Most of these women who have lost their main breadwinner now depend on aid money, have little access to health, maternity, or self-care facilities. As in the words of one uh, female participant, I can recall the day after my husband had been killed. It was, I was nine months pregnant. I felt a sore pain in my belly, so I visited the doctor and she asked me to go to the labor room for the delivery. Since I didn't have any money to pay the bill and other expenses, I came home with a heavy heart where I delivered my daughter. Our uh, key question focuses on how does Shia persecution particularly affect poor Hazara women in Quetta? We explored uh, the internal nuances and complexities within the Hazara community by comparing Hazara men and women. Hazara men being the main target of militants have suffered the most. However, the challenges that women have faced, such as uh, being widowed, restriction on mobility, and the issue of honor for young Hazara girls have largely remained unaddressed. Our research further investigates the effect of securitization or policing on Hazara women and how does the ghettoization of the Hazara community affect the Hazara women from socioeconomically excluded backgrounds. 
On the question whether, whether security check posts have improved the sense of security, with the exception of a few respondents, most thought otherwise. As in the words of one teenage participant, I believe that they themselves are involved in such incidents. These many incidents could not occur without security operators' help and support. We have also observed that the policing have limited the prospect of job opportunities and mobility for Hazara women. Poor Hazara women cannot go out due to the security and mobility issues, hence they are forced to buy things of daily use at higher prices. So uh, to conclude, uh, based on the responses of the participants, it is evident that there is a serious and distinctive impact on Hazara women regarding the issue of Shia persecution and the securitization as they create more challenges in terms of access to education, uh, livelihood, and um, economic opportunities for Hazara women than, than for men. We also noticed a subtle uh, variation within the Shia Hazara women of low income backgrounds and women headed families. And it was brought up many times that experiences and suffering of poor women are double than those Hazara women who do not have to struggle financially. So I will end here that Hazara are a double minority as one uh, male participant described, but the Shia Hazara women are a multi-layered minority within Shias who are subject to further marginalization due to their gender, uh, class, and religious ethnic uh, affiliations. I will uh, uh, now uh, uh, give the mic to Sadiqa. She will explain further, and she'll also talk about uh, the nuances and the internal uh, contradictions. And Sadiqa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maryam. Very kind of you. Um, so I'll briefly uh, go through methodology and major findings of the study. Uh, we have used participatory ranking methodology in our research. And as the researcher on the ground, I made sure that our focus group discussions and interviews were not mere instruments of data collection. Instead, they were communal gatherings, safe spaces, basically, where participants could speak their hearts and mind and listen to each other and bond over a meal or tea. And since uh, I am from the community and share similar experiences with them, the best thing that I witnessed was that the participants did not have to make an extra effort to convince me or themselves that their sharings were important or genuine. So um, coming to major findings now, I will talk about education, um, economic conditions and religious freedom as Mariam has already covered the safety and security section. Um, education. Education is the defining factor for Hazara's survival and social mobility because they do not own large chunks of agriculture or commercial lands, uh, nor they have big businesses in the province. So Hazara literacy rate was very high, uh, but due to terrorist attacks uh, between 2008 to 2014, it declined significantly. Um, so you could tell that 80 to 90% of the master level students and most of them female students dropped out of the universities in Koita when their buses were attacked. The fear of being targeted is the main reason that parents are afraid of allowing their daughters to commute to no-go areas of the Koita where these universities are situated. Um, their priority has completely changed in terms of education. They want their daughters uh, to stay safe and secure rather than be educated, even if that means staying home or getting them married earlier than they have um, thought or planned. Um, so some of the Hazara young women who decide to take all the risks and attend the universities in Koita, they are prone to discrimination, harassment and abuse. So Hazara teen girls in the FGDs repeated, uh, mentioned it repeatedly that they were bullied questioned and discriminated against in the um, educational institutions because of their religious and ethnic identity. I had this feeling that these poor um, teenagers had to carry burden of defending their religious identity on a daily basis. Um, connected with education is the uh, economic condition and livelihood opportunities. The overall security situation has severely affected the economic conditions of the community. For Hazara women, the challenges are even more severe because they not only uh, face uh, 
uh, discrimination at the hands of the general population, but also at the hands of the community itself in the form of moral policing. Um, uh, well, I hope that later on I'll have time to elaborate more this moral, moral policing. Um, so the Hazara uh, women, they, they face discrimination at the hands of the community in the form of moral policing that prevents them from exploring job and work opportunities. And it also, of course, in, uh, includes interaction with non-Hazara population. Um, so I witnessed during these um, interactions that the hardest hit section was women-headed families that barely uh, ensured two meals a day for their kids. Shelter and house rents may, uh, remained a key challenge for them. They mainly depended on the aid and philanthropic contributions that the community uh, made, but it's hardly ever sufficient. So the result is this, that these kind of families have to give up on a balanced diet, health consultations, recreation, and even sometimes the education of the kids. So um, this brings me to the, the last portion of the religious freedom. Um, religious freedom is interestingly ranked at the third in the aggregate ranking of the all the uh, FGDs and interviews that I conducted. Um, the reason for this, as I understand, is that for Hazara, the right to life and the right to have access to education um, and livelihood are more urgent. So as important as the religious identity and freedom is, it cannot provide a means of subsistence. So the community is afraid of practicing or displaying their uh, religious beliefs in public beyond Hazara neighborhoods. They do not feel safe um, if they have to offer prayer uh, publicly um, uh, because they can be easily identified and thus targeted. So regarding the religious attendance of the rituals, within the vicinity, um, as we found through the discussions uh, in the FGDs and interviews, that Hazara locality, the attendance within the Hazara locality has increased while it has declined outside the neighborhoods, owing to the risk of the attack by sectarian militants. Uh, for women, the attendance of religious uh, rituals has slightly declined. And um, so there are two reasons for this. One is cultural, uh, that says that representing um, religious identity is mainly considered to be responsibility of the men. And the other one is actually the uh, because of the uh, non-Shia population, there's a lot of uh, misconception and pro propagation of the inappropriate commentary about men and women interaction do we, uh, do, during this um, religious morning rituals. So uh, this brings me to the last, to, to the very last portion. Well, there's so much to fix and change in order to, uh, for Hazara women to live a normal and secure life. Um, uh, other than improving the security, some of the, mo uh, some of the most immediate needs, uh, I would say, are um, a dedicated scholarship program for them so that they have access uh, to education outside Kuita and outside Balochistan, at least. And then um, because they, their uh, mobility is restricted, so they need some sort of livelihood support, maybe some introduction of some sort of uh, skill and livelihood development program with some financial incentive um, and grants. Uh, and also because there's so much uh, mental health issues uh, that we have also mentioned in our report. Um, so some sort of well-designed and well-integrated psychosocial support program would also be a great deal of help. Um, uh, hopefully I will get some more time later on to talk about the moral policing. Thank you so much. Over to Marise again. Thank you very, very much, Mariam Kanwera and Sadika Sultan. This was very helpful. And of course, it's bringing back again when you're talking about um, um, psychosocial support uh, following trauma, we tend to associate that with women living in violent conflict situations, but it does get off the grid. It does fall in between the cracks when we're talking about women in everyday circumstances, um, such as those that you are talking about who would not have been conventionally uh, talked about in a, uh, in a non-conflict setting. So thank you for reminding us of those very complex and important um, policy implications. Um, really, really appreciate it. And really appreciate that Aisha Khan has kindly agreed to uh, present some of the findings that Seema um, has um, uh, shared with us in her paper through her work uh, with the Hindu women and men in Sindh province um, in Pakistan where she was particularly working with very uh, socioeconomically marginalized um, Hindu men and women. Um, Aisha, over to you. 
Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to um, present the research uh, for the um, Hindu community that was studied um, under the CREATE program on Pakistan. Um, my apologies for any errors I might make in advance. I'd stepped in just at the last minute. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that um, this was a study uh, similar to the one that we just heard about the Hazara Shia community that explores the reality of life from the perspective of Hindu women and girls who face um, intersecting and overlapping inequalities due to their religious identity, their gender, and their caste. They carry a heavy burden among the marginalized groups in Pakistan, facing violence, discrimination, exclusion, lack of access to education, transport, healthcare, along with occupational discrimination, and a high threat of abduction, forced conversions, and forced marriages. The research that um, I'm sharing with you today was carried out in Karachi, in the province of Sindh in Pakistan, during the period of March to May 2020. It explored poor Hindu women's marginalization through three key axes. First, how and where they experienced discrimination based on their religious identity. Second, how and where they experience gender discrimination even within their own communities. And third, how these experiences are different from those of the poor men in their communities. Four focus group discussions were conducted with a total of 46 participants. 34 women and girls were um, included and 12 men. All of the participants were members of the Hindu scheduled caste communities in Pakistan, which represent the most economically marginalized among the Hindu population. A mixed method approach was used to draw out both quantitative and qualitative data findings. Initially, a participatory ranking exercise was carried out with each focus group to identify the biggest threats they believed poor women in their communities face. Each individual participant then ranked these threats, leading to an aggregated list of the top seven threats they face. Upon generating this list of threats, the researchers then facilitated discussions with each focus group to unpack each of these threats and identify cross-cutting themes that impact the women and girls in myriad ways. So what were the findings of this extensive research? Researchers found that the top seven threats identified that within poor Hindu women and girls face are first, discrimination based on religious identity, particularly as a result of their dress and appearance when out in public. Next was sexual harassment and bullying. Third, of course, and not surprising, was the fear of abduction. Next was fear of forced conversions and forced marriages, which we've also heard much about in the media. Next was gender discrimination within both their own communities and wider society, particularly domestic violence and punishment if they tried to speak out against the violence they face within wider society. Next was lack of access to education. And finally, the top, the seventh greatest threat they face was restrictions on their dress and mobility. Discrimination based on religious identity intersects with many of the other issues that arose in the discussions. For example, Hindu women's ability to travel and move around their locality is heavily affected by religious discrimination and harassment, as is their ability to rent houses to live in or shops from which to sell the wares typical of their caste. When people learn that a woman is Hindu, typically from her traditional dress, the harassment ranges from insults and staring, the refusal to sit close to her on public transport, or even inappropriate touching, or a simple refusal to continue a transaction with her, such as the renting of a property. Access to healthcare and education, including the learning materials used within schools and education and colleges, and the ability to even celebrate Hindu festivals were all other examples of areas of life that are limit limited by religious discrimination and exclusion. Despite this extensive everyday discrimination, Hindu and women and girls did not want to abandon their religion. This is true despite a growing number of cases of Hindu families forced to convert to Islam due to debilitating poverty exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
sexual harassment and bullying from wider society is particularly relevant on public transport, which due to their ex economic exclusion, these Hindu women are limited or forced to use in order to be mobile. Domestic violence is another problem within the community, but it was acknowledged amongst respondents that no one, participants, that no one really speaks about this violence. And the women expressed a desire not to say anything detrimental about the men in their community for fear of adding to the negative portrayal of this community by wider society. Similarly, Hindu men are reluctant to challenge the violence that women and girls experienced at the hands of men within broader society because they don't want to invite further exclusion and harassment. Instead, the women stated that they direct their anger and frustration at the men, which leads them to silencing themselves in the future when they experience violence and harassment. The key discussion points that were repeated throughout the focus group discussions included the impact of Hindu women wearing their traditional dress in public, something which made them identifiable as non-Muslim and invited a wide range of discrimination and harassment behaviors. They also discussed the very real threat of Hindu girls and young women being abducted and forced to convert to Islam, which is a major reason that community men and elders place extensive restrictions on Hindu women and girls mobility. Our discussions also found that limits on religious identity intersect with their caste, limiting Hindu women and girls mobility, their job opportunities, and restricting them to working as sanitation workers and domestic workers. The recommendations that emerge from this research that were shared by participants in all the focus group discussions are made, were made to tackle the marginalization and discrimination they face. First, they were recommending that the criminal laws bill, the protection of minorities bill that was first proposed for the Hindu community to government in, by the Hindu community to government in 2016 and later amended must nonetheless be passed in order to, to protect Hindu girls under the age of 18 from forced marriages and conversions. The recommendation was that the bill must uphold five years of punishment for those who groom, abduct, and forcibly convert Hindu girls and young women. The next recommendation was that textbook and curriculum material from primary schools levels all the way to colleges must be modified to ensure the removal of hate speech and discriminatory attitudes towards Hindus in the texts, especially where this is related to the history of the partition of India. Additionally, there must be effective mechanisms of complaint in place to allow Hindu students in educational institutions who experience discrimination on the basis of religion to report this and for action to be taken. Another recommendation was for religious minority women to be integrated into mainstream politics. Specifically, there must be seats even within the existing gender quotas reserved particularly for minority women in the local, provincial, and national assemblies to ensure their political participation and representation. They must be included in programs for their socioeconomic empowerment at both government and non-government levels. Data is also needed to record acts of violence against minorities and Hindu women in Sindh, such as forced conversions, abductions, harassment in both rural and urban areas. On the basis of this data, we would be able to get a clearer picture of the reality that they face and better equip the non-government organizations and the Hindu community to advocate for the legislation that they need. Another recommendation was for job quotas for minorities to be implemented correctly with jobs other than sanitary work and sweeping to be made accessible for minority women. And finally, there was a recommendation that an independent commission for religious and gender equality or similar institution to be set up to investigate and receive complaints related to minority women. They should also offer advice to victims of discrimination and undertake awareness raising to activities to promote the principles of non-discrimination and understanding between different communities. So I'll close with, um, with this brief presentation and we look forward to um, questions that we might be able to respond to in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Aisha, for a very comprehensive overview of, of a very long paper. I think Seema's <laughs> paper is 90 pages. So thank you for uh, um, summarizing this in, in such a helpful way. And of course, there are a number of threads running here. 
um, the issue of grooming appearing in the law is so important because we tend to focus on the visible forms of violence, uh, sexual harassment, touching, uh, rape, abduction, but grooming, ideologically motivated grooming as a way of controlling the demography of the Hindu population or any population, uh, grooming as a, as a pre-orchestrated tool um, is something that in this program we will be focusing on in the next phase of our work because it's so important in that it's an invisible form of power. And uh, because it doesn't get documented and understood, uh, people just say, well, uh, what is the evidence that this young woman did not go and marry this man of her free accord? What is the evidence that you have uh, that this uh, was not consensual? And the, 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 the key point here is it's the grooming. It's how the grooming um, occurred and occurred in a pre-orchestrated and um, systematic manner showing a pattern across the Hindu and in some parts Christian community that makes us very aware that these are not love marriages, but there is something um, quite, uh, um, quite, quite uh, pre-planned um, there that is not just aimed at the young woman, but is aimed at having an effect on the community as a whole. So thank you for that. And uh, now um, we will pass on to Dr. MK, who um, did the work uh, with uh, Ahmadiyya women and men. Um, and this was so important because as you are very aware that uh, the Ahmadiyya community has had to always uh, be very, uh, well, uh, what's the word? I mean, they, they, they've never been able to freely manifest their identities. So being able to create a safe space for the Ahmadiyya women and men to speak openly and freely and, and not just speak openly, but, but feel that they can entrust the person that they are speaking to with what they are sharing is critical. It's not just the sharing, it's the trust of knowing the person you are working with is someone who's trustworthy um, and who will, um, will, 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 will use the co co-creation of the agenda and whatever process is happening in a way that um, will not jeopardize their well-being or their safety. So we're very, very grateful to have had Dr. MK with us in, the, in this program um, and all the research he's done. He is now going to join us uh, through an audio uh, connection. Thank you, Dr. MK, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Maris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank Creed for inviting me to this event. Uh, my focus will be to highlight the gender-based perspectives on key issues of financially weak and the Muslim women who are already facing the faith-based persecution in Pakistan. Uh, let me introduce uh, the community first, so everybody uh, know the context of the research. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat was founded by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed in India in 1889. And now the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is present in more than 200 countries in the world. And there are around five to six million Ahmadiyya uh, people in Pakistan. It is believed that there are 72 sects of Islam other than Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. The difference between the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat and all other sects is that Ahmadis believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who was the founder of the Jamaat, is the same promised Messiah who was prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad. Other sects believe that promised Messiah is yet to come and therefore Mirza Ghulam Ahmad is a false prophet and his followers are non-Muslims. In 1974, the state of Pakistan declared the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat as non-Muslims. And in 1984, President Zial Haq issued the Ordinance XX, which provides the imprisonment extending, extending to three years and unlimited fines to an Ahmadi Muslim who in any way behaves like a Muslim or refers to him or herself as a Muslim. The law further says that any act of an MD Muslim which seems relevant to Islam will be considered as blasphemy. It is important to mention here that the only punishment for blasphemy is death penalty, according to the Federal Sharia Shri uh, Court of Pakistan. In my current study, I used participative ranking methodology for the data collection. 
findings are based upon the semi structure interviews of three focus groups each composed of 10 participants the first focus group was composed of poor md women whose age was more than 35 years second focus focus group was composed of md poor women whose age was less than 35 but above 18 years and the third focus group was composed of md men initially a questionnaire was devised by conducted by conducting a pilot study during this study i found 25 key issues and prioritized uh, by the men and women it was found that md women are persecuted in all dimensions such as political dimension constitutional and legal dimension judicial dimension social and economic dimension and cultural and religious dimension although the men and women had similar perspectives about the issues they prioritized them differently 28 person issues got the same ranking by the men and the women among them three issues which are directly related to the state sponsored persecution were of top concern invariably for every participant these issues include fear of imprisonment and death under anti india laws no access to their mosques and the prohibition marking important occasions within india calendar unfortunately killing of ahmadis in pakistan continues to rise in last four months four ahmadis have been murdered just because of their ahmadiya faith last week 31 years old dr tahir was murdered and his three companions were seriously injured by a teenager who when they were praying together inside their own home dr tahir's father is still in critical condition and other two seriously injured are in hospital 20% issues were given higher priority by the women than were ranked by their men these issues include discrimination in educational institutes the media overlooking their problems harassment due to wearing a hijab not being able to shop in local areas and observing religious customs that are not a part of their religion it makes sense discrimination due to their faith and fear of persecution force most poor and the men to find job far away from their homes where their religious identity is not exposed while back at home their women especially married women take care of their households children and property and young women go to educational institutes that are near to their homes therefore because people are familiar with their family backgrounds they directly and very frequently face discrimination due to their non religious faith during grocery shopping and attending educational institutes in their vicinities the women from md families who can hide their religious identities unwillingly participate in some religious customs being observed in their neighborhoods so that others will believe them to be of that faith interestingly 52% of the issues were ranked higher by the men than the women the key reason for difference in perceptions related to the ranking is perhaps the men's sense of helplessness towards their women when in need the men's only reaction to oppression against their women was either to seek asylum abroad or to migrate with their families to rabwa which is a city of pakistan of 96% and their population due to the said issues and many more which are presented in my paper and report you can see that many poor md women try to hide their religious identity as much as possible to be accepted by the society however md women are identified easily mainly due to two reasons number one they live in highly populate populated regions where everyone is familiar with their religious backgrounds and number two their hijab is different from the muslim from other muslim women therefore 
they are very vulnerable to the ahmdiya anti ahmdiya laws there are two key drivers of continued hate and harassment against them one hate speeches by both political and religious leaders in pakistan and second the media who is responsible for spreading inaccurate and biased information about the ahmdiya muslim community and baseless ag- allegations against them at the end i would like to share a quote from a party spent which can give you uh, uh, the clue that how women are feeling there in pakistan the quote says we are not spared even after our deaths and in our graves in pakistan we are not allowed to say a prayer which is offered before before burial of our dead bodies our graves are disentombed even in the graveyards which are the property of ahmdiya muslim jamaat our dead bodies are exhumed it is in the context of several incidents when ahmdiya uh, uh, graveyards uh, were destroyed i gave different recommendations at the end of my report but i will present only one of that uh, due to the shortage of time i will share only one that state sponsored persecution is the most dangerous form of marginalization of religious minority and therefore it should be stopped thank you very much for your attention thank you very much dr mk uh, these i think the, the 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 tragedy of what you're saying is that not only do people live on the margins while they're alive but as you said the sanctity of the dead the ability to uh, just mourn and 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 um con- uh, maintain that 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 link with those that have passed away even that is under compromise and what you're saying about uh being targeted because of the hijab is very important because um some people would argue well if you know if hindu women um are being targeted because they wear the sari it's because it's a conservative society um so and women are expected to cover up so even if uh, you are a sunni muslim who's not covered up uh, you would be uh, also harassed um but the point here is harassment happens even when you are wearing a hijab such as that worn by ahmadiyya women which is one that is covering your body from head to toe and your 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 face is covered your head is covered your hands are showing so this is not about conservatism this is not about how uh, what is the size how many inches of clothing a woman wears this is about a process of religious homogenization in which anyone who is different anyone who is not conforming to what the mainstream society expects and what the state complicitly allows to happen is then be- becomes a target even when they are fully dressed or because they are fully dressed such as the ahmadiyya women so um thank you for that and uh um i i do agree there are very important policy messages um that we need to discuss and i hope we can come back to them in our discussion um i want to now move to uh give the floor to naumana who will be presenting another very important paper on the intersections of being a christian um and a member of a socioeconomically excluded group um and living in context of marginality um that she has undertaken um and she'll tell us more about thank you naumana over to you uh thank you so much uh professor mariz i'm uh, uh can you hear me i hope it's going we can hear you oh, beautifully okay okay great so uh thank thank you so much uh, to uh, all the colleagues who have shared the uh, you know their papers uh, and uh, to the our keynote speaker the special rapporteur uh, professor malis as well and ideas for organizing this event so uh, since we have a, a very limited time to share the th- uh, the findings um which you can always read in the paper uh what uh, we have done so i would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, what this research paper is about uh, and then the situation of minority and particularly uh, christian women and girls uh, then share its salient findings of the paper and followed by the major recommendations uh, so uh, this study is uh, 
an effort to understand the situation of Christian poor minority women and girls in Pakistan, uh, to bring uh, their situation and their issues to the attention of decision makers and to utilize the findings uh, for awareness raising and advocacy for the rights of minority women, particularly the Christian minority women in Pakistan. So the key uh, things uh, or the focus of the research questions were to explore the daily life experiences of these poor women, to examine that how these are different from the other poor women from the same context. Uh, when I say the other poor women, uh, so the poor women from the majority community, uh, which, is, uh, which has happened to be Muslim community uh, in Pakistan. So, uh, and inspecting if the religious discrimination faced by the poor Christian women differs from the discrimination faced by the affluent Christian women. And then again, how does that difference uh, between the experiences of men and women who belong to the same religious group uh, is different to, in order to understand that intersection of gender with class and religious affiliation affects uh, their rights and their freedoms in the society. So uh, for this purpose, uh, you carry out uh, eight focus group discussions uh, and with the, out of them, six were with the poor minority women and uh, two were with the uh, men from the same strata. And then uh, we had in total seven interviews uh, with the affluent Christian women, uh, which included uh, parliamentarians, professor, uh, banker, uh, some human rights and minority rights activists in leading position in their organization. So to examine uh, the situation, what they, they are faced with. So in general, as my colleagues have already uh, shared uh, with you that uh, the gender-based discrimination is uh, prevalent in Pakistan. However, women and girls belonging to religious minorities or belief communities face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination in addition to those of an average Pakistani women and girl. Uh, for instance, minority women face discrimination uh, on the basis of being a woman in a patriarchal society. Uh, they face discrimination, happen to be from the member of a religious minority community. And then they also face uh, discrimination if they, because they are socially and economically marginalized. So uh, all this situation and this discrimination against religious minority women, this uh, this whole range is uh, starts from the social exclusion in their daily life and different forms of harassment to abduction, rape, forced conversion, forced and underage marriages. Uh, when uh, we asked uh, to the participants to the interviews uh, of this uh, research that what is the greatest threat in in order to uh, uh, to define uh, through the participatory ranking, so. Interestingly, uh, the, from all the focus group discussion, what we found uh, was that religious discrimination is one of the greatest uh, threat uh, which they are faced with. I say religious discrimination, it, not, it does not mean that the whole society or the whole of the Muslim community is discriminating against some minority communities in general, but of course this mean that uh, a, a big, a large part of the majority community is being uh, discriminating, uh, discriminated towards the minority community members. So uh, uh, there are the respondents who have shared with us uh, their, their experiences and how they have felt. For instance, one female respondent said that I was a student because most of this respondent, they, were, uh, they have gone through this, to the school till five, fifth grade. So interestingly, the respondent who faced discrimination, uh, they were the students at the government or other private schools. And the respondents who did not face discrimination, those were the students who three, four or fifth grade uh, in the community run schools or the church run schools. So a female respondent told us that when I was a student at a government school, I was asked to use separate glass to drink water or bring my own water. Then the, the religious discrimination they face because most of them, almost all of them were from the low strata, from the poor community, marginalized community. So uh, they happen to be work as a domestic worker, as sanitation worker or as factory workers. So most of them said that they have 
been asked by their owners or by their managers to use separate utensils where they work. So uh, when this is not due to the uh, hygiene or due to the, you know, uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it has been persistent even since long uh, before that pandemic as well. Uh, and that is because of the biasness that they happen to be from the specific faith community, uh, which shows that they are not being allowed to use the same utensils, though their co-workers, uh, from their co-workers, I mean their co-workers, their colleagues who work as a domestic help uh, and who belong uh, to the Muslim community, uh, they have been never asked by the, uh, by the managers or by the household owners to use separate utensils. So, the, so they are working at the same level, but they, they still face discrimination because of their uh, faith belongings. Uh, and another example uh, which they shared is that uh, during the religious occasions, uh, their Muslim colleagues, co-workers, they do get uh, a good number of holidays. Um, but uh, when that the question comes for their holidays, uh, for Easter or for Christmas, so they are not allowed for more than one or maximum two. And even if they go ahead with the Easter Monday holiday, because Easter falls on Sunday, so they, their salary would be deducted. But when their co-workers, they are on Eid holidays, so these Christian household workers or factory workers or sanitation workers, they are being asked to work in, in lieu of their colleagues. And then they are not being paid for that extra work uh, at all. So uh, these all uh, intersecting form of inequality uh, because of their religious affiliation. There is another example uh, which they have shared, uh, which is a kind of heart wrenching the, the, the experience and the level of discrimination they have faced to is that they are being humiliated uh, by being called chura or churi, which is basically a derogatory term used specifically uh, for the Christian community member uh, to look down upon them and uh, specifically for those who are associated with the sanitation work, but in general, also for the whole Christian community uh, residing in the country. So there have been several uh, instances. There has been a recent, uh, recently a video being uh, you know, shared uh, on the social media where a woman from the Muslim community, she's sharing the experience that a neighbor from uh, her society where she lives in has come to her and asked her whether your house helper is a Christian. And she said, yes. So her neighbor asked her that you should uh, not allow her to work in your home and don't ask her to cook for you. And when she said, why I shouldn't uh, ask her to cook for me, she says, you know, she's, uh, she's a non-Muslim. These are the churas, again, using that derogatory term. And they, they are meant to do the work of, uh, you know, the work as a sanitation worker rather than doing cooking in our households. And if you would continuously allow that women to come and do, the, uh, do your kitchen work, I would complain and I would, you know, uh, alert the neighbors that you are not a faithful Muslim. So that religious discrimination is affecting at the one side very badly to the religious minority community and women. But again, from the majority community, community these people are again in the jeopardy, uh, how to face it, how to handle it. So uh, these are the examples which we have recently seen. So on the contrary, uh, these interviews told us that when it comes to call the names, uh, you know, for, uh, for the members who have been working uh, in, in the same household from the majority community. So they would use, they are always, always used to call them as uh, BB, um, as Bua, as Apaji. So uh, basically, uh, all these words are giving respect to them, but not, uh, uh, you know, not being used as a derogatory uh, term. So this is how they have been marginalized. So these disparities in their workplace have contributed to further segregation among the members of different communities. And this shows that even poor members of different communities suffer from the same phenomenon of poverty. However, the aforementioned biases further marginalize poor members from the religious minorities, particularly the poor member, the minority women from these religious minorities. And this inculcate a sense of superiority among the household helpers from the majority community that, you know, because of 
they are being associated with a specific faith group, so they are superior to them. So uh, another thing which is very important, which is being highlighted by the members of uh, the, uh, uh, the community is that all the male and female responded highlighted the issue of forced conversion as a particular form of violence against minority women and girl. And particularly uh, uh, since this research paper talks about the Christian minority women and girls. So that has highlighted that this phenomenon has also affected their freedom of mobility uh, as well. And that has been, you know, resulted in imposing restriction because out of the fear of them being abducted or being forcibly converted or being uh, forced to get uh, marriage, uh, get married while they are not at the age of marriage. So that has also resulted uh, in, in the form of uh, violence, specifically with regards to their mobility, as well as their freedom of religion or belief. So uh, there have been multiple evidences uh, for Apologies. I think now Mana's uh, internet connection is playing up. Um, I, uh, because we, we've come to almost the end of now Mana's presentation and you will have a chance to ask her specific questions and her policy recommendations are very clearly set out in her paper. Um, I'm going to um, um, actually come back to now Mana with the questions that you have for her um, on any of the issues that she's raised uh, today and um, she can join us when her internet is uh, not playing up. Um, so um, without further ado, I think we, we're now going to open the floor to comments and questions. Please keep your comment to no more than um, a minute so that um, we can hear from everyone and learn from everyone. Um, and um, uh, I, uh, um, uh, Said, uh, Said Ho'i has, uh, 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 asked to, oh, uh, you've joined us. Sorry now, for this, in, yeah, sorry uh, for this. Do you mind if we come back to you in the Q&A because we've already gone well over time, if that's okay with you. And I know you will have a lot of questions on forced abductions and, and forced marriages, uh, which you have uh, worked with directly with survivors of this. So I know there'll be a lot of questions uh, for you. Sure. So we, thank you now, Mana. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, so we now move to um, uh, two people who've asked uh, to, to share the reflections with us. We will start with uh, Said Khoi. Said Khoi is the CEO of the Khoi Foundation, and he is a member of the steering committee of Creed and one of the architects of Creed. So, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Apologies. Before we take, um, I was a bit too, too uh, I was in haste a bit to go straight to the questions because I knew people would want to ask about Naumana. But I think to help us, uh, get into the questions and ask the right questions. Um, I'm actually going to pass uh, the word to Mike Batcock from the FCDO, um, who will share his reflections and help us think about our questions forward. Um, sorry, Mike, um, uh, please, the, the, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me to discuss this. I'm Mike Babcock. I work in the Inclusive Societies Department in the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, the UK government is committed to defending freedom of religion or belief for all and promoting respect between different religions and non-religious communities. Promoting the right to freedom of religion or belief is one of the UK government's human rights policy priorities. Societies that aim to protect and promote freedom of religion or belief are more stable, more prosperous, and likely to be more resilient against violent extremism. This work today has been so exciting, inspiring, and important. The work is so important because of one, its focus on women and girls, and two, because of its deep understanding of the intersections of inequalities. The focus on women and girls. So much of the literature on religious minorities has focused on men and has paid little to, a little attention to the nature and the impact of religious persecution on women. This work 
has explored the experience and marginalization of women and girls. It has been truly participative, creating safe spaces for the discussions, creating first-hand accounts of marginalization and discrimination, real lived lives. Through their own words, women and girls have revealed the different forms of discrimination they face. The, inter the understanding of the intersection of inequalities, using a framework of intersecting inequalities has revealed the specific forms of marginalization and discrimination that are often missed in other investigations on general faith-based persecution. The work is focused on the intersection of gender, religious, ethnic affiliations, class, education, jobs, mobility, mental and psychological health issues. They have really created the complexity of the multi-layered marginalizations. The, the, there is a wealth of findings from all of these uh, reports. The women have identified the key challenges they face as a result of discrimination and persecution. Um, there are so many that I could cover. I mean, just to highlight a few that seem so important to look at. Access to education, access to quality education, and discrimination within education when they are able to access education. Livelihoods and specifically job opportunities and economic opportunities. Safety and security, this is such a huge one, especially the immense risk involved when trying to leave restricted neighborhoods, the fear of abduction, the fear of forced conversion, forced marriage, sexual harassment and bullying. There are many more I could talk about like discrimination, religious freedom and grooming, all very important. And the, the research didn't just look at, look at the, the findings, it's also identified clear ways of taking the work forward. They've got clear, coherent recommendations. And there again, there are so many clear recommendations from the uh, presentations and from the reports. Unsurprisingly, there's a need to highlight on uh, security and safety, the need for robust legal and judicial safeguards, the need to tackle institutionalized violence, forced conversion, forced marriages, ab abduction and rape. There is also the need to look at education, the need to look at the textbooks and curricula from primary schools all the way to college to remove uh, discriminatory attitudes and hate speech. Uh, raising awareness and sensitization programs at educating uh, government of offices and teachers, as well as improving intercommunal understanding. There are so many areas that I could look at or raise. It's been such an important piece of work I'm definitely going to be using the work by circulating the policy briefs across DFID and the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. So yet again, I'd just like to thank you for such exciting, um, inspiring and important work. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And, and, and thank you, obviously, for all your support for us across the years and across the months. Um, the, the, this research was undertaken under exceptional circumstances, um, COVID-19, um, which meant that uh, uh, all, all, all the authors had to do this work while uh, taking into account do no harm um, in how they, they undertake the work um, within the, with, with community members without putting them in danger. Um, it was also an exceptional time in terms of turmoil. Um, and um, I, I want to go back to towards the end of what next, what is after this report, both for Pakistan and the four other countries in which we work. But first, I think with the very important areas, sites of targeting and discrimination that Mike has helped us, has helped concretize for us, um, and which also draw on uh, the presenters, I want to open the floor um, 
Sayyid Yusuf al Khoi has said he, he'll, 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 he'll come back with a word later. So um, uh, accordingly, we'll go to uh, Fatima, uh, who has wanted to share a reflection, um, and then we will go to the questions. Um, so Fatima, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, thank you for the opportunity. As I mentioned in my brief, my name is Fatima Ali Heather. I, um, I'm a medical doctor by profession, belong to the Shia minority community of Pakistan. Unfortunately, I lost my husband and my son in a sectarian terrorism incident in 2013. Since then, uh, we have set up an organization called the Grief Directory, which works with the victims of terrorism uh, in Pakistan for the last five years. Based on our work, we've experienced how uh, closely terrorism is linked to extremism. So we also work with the youth to promote interfaith harmony and peace. And uh, thank you so much for uh, today's platform. It is indeed an absolutely essential conversation which was held today. And I'm so glad to uh, uh, see uh, wonderful women uh, offering support towards the minority women. I would just like to add a couple of points. Number one is that uh, based on uh, my own experience of work, number one, we lack, definitely lack data. Uh, it has been said in uh, today's conversation as well, and, but I can't emphasize it more, that data is something of absolute importance. Uh, when we uh, try to design a project or try to offer support, the first thing that is lacking is data on the minorities of Pakistan, uh, especially if we talk about the Hazara community. There are no official figures available about the number of casualties, the disabilities, and um, how many families have been affected. and what is happening to those families um, uh, which have been left behind. So I'm really looking forward to reading this uh, paper by, uh, by Aisha and uh, by Sadika. Secondly, I want to mention uh, the importance of creating a common platform for the minority women uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, especially focusing on the community empowerment projects because community empowerment is something which I have also faced by my experience is another absolute essential in Pakistan based on the fact that we uh, have lost so many men folk in the sectarian terrorism incidents and the women and the female headed households including widows and young girls are the ones who are left behind. So uh, I would also invite all the participants today and people who are learning to think about creating a common platform for the minority women. And thirdly, I wanted to uh, uh, I, because of my work, I very well understand the struggles of the Hazara community. I understand uh, what the Ahmadi community is going through. We have also worked with the Christian uh, victims of terrorism as well, and the situation there is unfortunate as well. But in terms of what Sadika mentioned, uh, uh, I am very much interested in what more can we do to offer some psychological support to the Hazara women. So, uh, and lastly, I would like to mention because Professor Karima is here that uh, on behalf of my organization, we are working with the UN Office of Countering Terrorism and Center for Countering Terrorism in developing good practices uh, in the area of civil society uh, to see how, uh, better, how better services can be offered to the victims of terrorism. So if uh, we can connect with Sadika um, uh, at this point to uh, offer any insights on this project, I would be more than happy to do that. Thank you so much. Fatima, we're very grateful for your very, very, very important points you've raised. Um, uh, and they're all very, uh, very relevant points. I think that the, the first point is that the importance of dealing with uh, trauma um, and uh, psychological distress. Second, the issue of data. Thirdly, the importance of solidarity and learning from across groups. Um, and I think this is where it's so, so important um, because, uh, because it's, it's through solidarity that we're able to um, um, learn and, and build and, and sustain each other. And yes, I strongly recommend that you uh, kindly get in touch with Mariam Kanwar and Sadiqa Sultan um, because uh, Mariam's leading our work uh, in, for Creed in, in Pakistan and uh, Sadiqa is obviously based, uh, she's done uh, a lot of the, the, the empirical work with the Hazara Shias. So I think that's fantastic. And of course, the point that you're raising to Professor Banun is so important because when we're dealing with Hazara Shias, we're not just dealing with the religious minority, we're dealing with a minority that has intersected um, with, uh, with ethnicity 
on the basis of their Hazara uh, affiliation. So thank you so much for these important points and we will be very glad to take them forward. Um, much appreciated. So now we're going to move to, uh, to questions and um, I want to share with you some of the questions and to whom they are for. And there's some important comments I think for us to also uh, pause at. Uh, but in terms of questions, um, I think for uh, Mariam um, and um, um, for for Mariam and Sadika, there is a question about. So I'll just share with you a set of questions, and then I will ask each one uh, to speak to the question um, that they uh, um, that they feel comfortable in in responding to. First one to uh, Mariam and Sadika has to do with the use of the term uh, Shia virus in relation to COVID-19 uh, in terms of the prevalence of the use of that term and what does it mean? Um, there's also uh, a very, so uh, we'll take, we'll just share with you a number of questions and then we'll- yeah, We have Kenya covered in this. So uh, the, then there's another very important uh, question um, pertaining um, to um, whether we have data on abductions and forced marriages. And I'll leave that to, um, um, to Naumana in particular to speak to. Um, we also have uh, a, a very important um, question around, um, this is to you, Mike, um, uh, that until today, the UK government um, has been committed in law to spending 0.7% on international aid. Um, where do we stand in future for, for, for that commitment and how would it affect freedom of religion or belief and our commitment to freedom of religion or belief? Um, we then have a, a, a number of uh, very, very um, useful recommend, uh, recommendations uh, put forward by Elaine um, that uh, is in the chat function, which you can all see. Um, we have um, also uh, some very, very interesting, again, links by Mahmoud Rafiq um, in terms of persecution of Ahmadiyya, uh, as discussed in Parliament. Uh, again, in the connections, and Julia is very helpfully helping us uh, understand the, the 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 Western equivalent or the English equivalent of uh, chora, as as Naumana had referred to, as, as basically calling someone someone that you're only fit to clean the toilets. Um, we also, um, I think, we'll, 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 there is a, a question here about using the term gender and whether that term leads to um, uh, giving the, um, fund well, uh, extremists a reason to attack the work that is being done when we talk about gender equality. And I think I'd love to hear uh, Professor Benun's reflections on um, uh, the, the terminology and um, how, how do you use it when you are engaging with rights um, in different contexts. So uh, we, um, perhaps we should go in chronological order on the basis of the speakers who appeared, um, who, who, who shared with us. So on, on that note, maybe I should start with um, Professor Banun, um, reflections on the use of the concept of gender and gender equality. Uh, this question was initially to Professor Melissa, who unfortunately couldn't, um, couldn't be with us for the second part of the panel. But I think um, I think Professor Benun, uh, you're the best person um, to respond to that one, um, and then we will go by uh, order of appearance in responding to any questions that have been raised. Um, so, Professor Benun, uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And let me say again how impressive the speakers' presentations have been and how much I've learned. So my gratitude to all of you. The question specifically about the terminology of uh, gender, uh, let me say a few things about that. Uh, we used to, in the United Nations, uh, speak about the category of sex. Uh, and so if you look at the early human rights standards, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Covenants on Human Rights, uh, the, the protected category in terms of uh, discrimination is the category of sex. Increasingly, there was a shift to the category of gender, so focusing on the sociology instead of the biology. Uh, and I think that 
in some ways that was an advance, um, but in some ways I think also increasingly with the discourse of gender, women risk getting lost again. And I am more and more wondering if we shouldn't talk about sex and gender. Um, I think the direction of the, the questioner's question was perhaps a little bit different in referring to uh, the specific impact of using the term gender in the context of Pakistan. And I think I leave it to our Pakistani uh, experts perhaps to respond to that. But I would say this, I am often told, oh, if you use uh, this language or uh, that language, uh, this issue happened with me recently related to a completely different topic but you will offend the fundamentalists and this is what makes them uh, attack people. And I think, you know, this really goes to an important point that Professor Tadros uh, made a few moments ago, which is that, you know, the fundamentalists are acting on their ideology. And in fact, I don't think it makes a significant difference uh, whether one uses the term gender or not to discuss these issues. It is the issues themselves about uh, the recognition of women's human rights and specifically uh, res the respect and dignity and e equality of religious minorities, including women within those minorities, that is the problem. And I'm not sure we can fix that problem by changing terminology. Nevertheless, I very much respect that different terminology may be most appropriate in specific contexts. And I hope that that goes some way to answering that very important question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Benoon. Much appreciated. Um, does, um, I think just in terms of uh, order of uh, appearance, I think it's um, um, uh, Mariam and Sadika. Would you like to take the questions about Hazara Shias and also um, the, the the use of the term the Shia virus uh, that was also referred? So a number of questions to you. Okay, so on uh, on the term of Hazara Shias, basically uh, we have covered uh, uh, this in our art in one of the articles that was published uh, at IDS's blog. Uh, so basically, this term was uh, used initially uh, to discriminate against the Shia community overall, but specifically the Hazara community. And in Blochistan specifically, measures were, te uh, were taken to targeting and restricting the movements of Hazara Shias. And they even uh, begin to be announced by a number of public authorities uh, prior to any uh, uh, overall uh, lockdown. So uh, initially, because the Shia pilgrims, they were coming from Iran. So the Shia pilgrims were only, they were only stopped at the borders and then uh, while the others non uh, Shias or non Hazaras, they were uh, sent to their homes without even temperature checks. So th this is uh, the term that was widely used against the Shia community overall, but in general um, against the Shia Hazaras. Sadaqa, would you uh, like to contribute more? Would you like to add something? Yeah, sure. It's just uh, so unfortunate that uh, that uh, um, how this um, the pandemic, then the COVID nineteen pandemic, added more um, you know layers of discrimination. Um, so um, so even the international travelers, they were coming from China and from Saudi Arabia and so many other countries as well. So only the pilgrims, uh, you know, coming back home from Iran, they were targeted. And even within those Shia um, uh, pilgrims. Um, there were so many testimonies, and we have covered this in the blog as well, um, that uh, in a bus of pilgrims of mi mixed ethnicities, the Hazara Shias were, you know, asked to leave the bus and they were, you know, um, kept in the isolation centers. And so also we have also covered the isolation centers and, and the, the situation there, the dire situation there, and most of the people kept there were women and children. Um, so entirely inhuman conditions and treated like animals. So all of this, um, just because of their religious and ethnic identity, and also because they make, well, the, the, there is this perception that they make a very, very easy prey and they cannot resist in, uh, in, 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 in very powerful ways. So, you know, just because they can do, so they do this. Thank you very, very much, Mariam and Sadika. I think the point that you're raising is so important because uh, people were coming in and out, but the question is who gets stopped and how are they treated and what emboldens 
um, the authorities to treat a certain group that they wouldn't uh, necessarily be emboldened to do with another group, even though they're all pilgrims. Thank you for this very important point. There is a, there is a query um, um, from participants about uh, the Shia in Tel Afar in Iraq, um, and they're targeting um, by uh, ISIS. And yes, we are uh, having a special report on um, the intersection of religious marginality and gender in Iraq. Um, and it's going to cover a wide array of women, um, including the Yazidis, the, uh, the, the um, Sabians, uh, the Christians, and it also includes the Shia uh, Turkmen in Tal Afar. And um, that component with Tal Afar we will be doing in association with uh, a Khoi Foundation uh, in Crete. So uh, yes, do please um, join, our jo join our newsletter so that you can find out when that report will be released. We're on it, but we've been delayed, unfortunately, because of COVID-19. Um, and then I think we have a number of questions on um, forced abductions. Um, um, before I move to uh, Naomana to comment in particular on forced abductions and marriages for both, um, for both Christians and Hindus, um, I just wonder whether, uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, Dr. MK on the Ahmadiyya? Or at least if you do, write it down while uh, Naumana engages with the question of forced abductions um, and marriages and the prevalence and um, what we know so far. Um, over to you, Naumana. Oh, by the way, I'm not ignoring Aisha, but Aisha had told us at the beginning that uh, she would appreciate Naumana responding to questions on forced abductions and marriages. So, um, again, if you have any other questions pertaining to the generic, situation of uh, Hindu, um, uh, Hindu women, um, uh, Aisha, on behalf of Seema, will be happy to take them for you. So Naomana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maurice. So, uh, of course, uh, the question with regards to the data, availability of data with regards to forced conversion or uh, forced marriages or underage marriages, uh, of course, there is some data available, but uh, it does not include all of the cases. Uh, there, uh, we believe that there are still cases who, uh, which goes unreported uh, because first of all, uh, in the trajectory uh, and in the case studies, we have seen that at the first stage, it, it has been very difficult to even to get registered the first information report of abduction of a minor girl, particularly from the Hindu or the Christian community. We have uh, a recently very highlighted case of Arzu Raja. Uh, we have seen this and after the Arzu Raja's case, there has been another case of Farah Shaheen. Uh, well, she is again uh, a minor, 12 years old. Uh, that tells us, uh, his fa her father's testimony tells us uh, lots of discrimination being uh, exercised while he went uh, to register the FIR and uh, uh, he's being called again that derogatory term Chura and he's, there was a lot of hurdles then he had to go through a long process to get it registered. Uh, one of his Muslim neighbor, he helped him. Uh, and of course, some activists and organization, they have helped him, but still uh, they are looking for you know, justice for their daughter. But we still do have case studies and testimonies from a uh, few girls who have returned, who were able to manage to come back from the captivity of their abductor. So in June, 2020, Shurimati Mekwar, she came back, she, she managed to uh, run from uh, her abductor and she gave her testimony uh, after her recovery, uh, that uh, after her abduction, this, th these are her words, that after uh, my abduction, I was converted forcefully and was pushed to work as sex worker. Uh, and then he, she shared that she wanted to go with her parents, so the court allowed uh, her to go and live with her parents. And there is another case. Uh, so this was the one case uh, from a Hindu community. And then there is another case from the uh, Christian community where Myra Shahbaz, she again managed to escape from her abductor. And uh, then she stated that I was abducted and later forced to sign a plain document. And later I was told that I have accepted Islam and had become a Muslim. They pressurized me and made my video being raped and said they will upload it if I will not say what they say. They told me that I had married that person, my abductor, 
and there is no way to go back. So these are the two uh, testimonies and there are others as well. So just, I, I have cited that as an example. So that tells us how uh, complicated this phenomena is. We do have uh, uh, some record, but again, there is a lot of uh, work required to get all of the cases on board. And I would like to simultaneously respond. There is a very valid suggestion by Fatima Heather to have a collective platform uh, which works for the minority women. So I would uh, like to share here that in October, we have initiated a minority women forum, which is, uh, it, it's a unique forum first of its own kind in, uh, in the country, uh, which, uh, which would advocate for the rights of minority women and girls. Thank you, Professor Maurice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomana. Um, I think there's also, um, well, we'll, 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 we'll take next the uh, question to Mike, and then there are a couple of questions um, that we'll come back to. Ah, there. Um, yes, um, there's not a lot that I can say about this because it's it's only just been announced, but I am sure the UK government will be firmly committed to international development and helping the world's poorest, and particularly on freedom of religion or belief. The Foreign Secretary only a couple of months ago highlighted that this was one of the key um, development priorities of the UK government, freedom of religion or belief. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. There was also a question regarding uh, data collected on forced abductions and conversions for Sikh women and girls. And of course, we know they are a tiny minority in Pakistan. And it, 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 it's, it's with deep regret that we did not have a, a Sikh um, component to our research. We should have. Unfortunately, we were not at that time um, um, uh, able to uh, identify someone um, that we would feel we would not put in danger and would be able to undertake this work. It's not too late and um, we welcome opportunities to work with the Sikh community in Pakistan and undertake similar work because this is just the first part of a report that we are doing on intersectionality in, in, in Pakistan. There's more work to be done, including um, a very, very important uh, paper um, that will be shared um, uh, shortly uh, in a few months, uh, written by Aisha Khan um, on how does the feminist movement engage with um, questions around the intersection of religious marginality um, and gender um, in Pakistan. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a fantastic paper, so look out for it. But also just to say there is a possibility, so do get in touch with us on that. Um, the, uh, the other uh, issue, I think, is, is, is just about um, uh, access to uh, the material that has been been placed on the chat function, because I realized we are three minutes from uh, closing our, our uh, panel. Uh, you will have noticed that um, if that Kat has sent the link to signing our newsletter, um, that would enable us to send you everything um, uh, on that. Because of data protection, as you can imagine, we can't send it to you unless we have your permission to share. Um, so do please sign up and you will find everything that has been shared in that chat function in that newsletter and previous newsletters. Um, so uh, that is that will make it accessible. Um, also, I think there, there's a lot of interest um, from uh, participants in, um, in, in getting to know some of the panelists. So I'm going to encourage the panelists to also put their emails in the chat function if you want to be approached uh, by uh, um, Participants who have joined us today, uh, we're, we're delighted that you have joined us. We're delighted that you want to connect with uh, the panelists. So uh, for the panelists, if you feel comfortable, do feel free to share your email in the chat function. Um, because we are about to close in a couple of minutes. It's, it's been, a, it's, um, it's been a, a very, uh, I think, powerful uh, set of um, interventions that have highlighted both ways in which those intersections of marginality converge and diverge depending on um, uh, group, depending on class, caste, uh, and um, uh, where they sit um, in terms of socioeconomic um, um, uh, 
positioning, but also ideology, as Professor, ben, uh, Professor Karima Benoun reminded us. Um, where are we going next? Well, we have a number of reports that use the same methodology for uh, Iraq, Myanmar, Nigeria, Egypt, and potentially Syria. Uh, because of COVID-19, we have been delayed, but uh, we've taken Pakistan as the first report to share with you, but it's the, the issues of inequalities facing women who belong to religious minorities or are, are affiliated to religious minorities isn't just in Pakistan, we see it as recurring um, across many contexts. And we will see this in Iraq, in Myanmar, in Nigeria, and so forth. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to share with you these findings using the same methodologies as they come out, which will also allow us um, to do cross comparisons between countries and within groups across different countries. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate all the learning that we have um, to benefit from your interactions and correspondence with us. So please accompany us on this journey, we need you. And um, um, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, our panelists, especially, um, and uh, Mike Batcock for joining us. Thank you so much. And of course, Professor Banun for, um, for, 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 for everything that you have offered and provided us uh, in, in our um, interactions and encounter today. And I just want to also end um, with thanking, a uh, special thank you to all the behind, and scene, um, behind the scenes team here at IDS who have made this possible. Um, a special uh, thank you to Kat Cheeseman, um, a special thank you to Amy, um, who has just been incredible in her accompaniment um, to all, all of us um, and all the support she's provided us. Um, a special uh, thank you to um, uh, Emily and uh, to Gary um, and to Susan. And um, just thank you everyone, uh, because we, as, uh, as Fatima mentioned, and it has been continuously repeated, we need solidarity, we need concerted and uh, organized action. And uh, perhaps we can continue, how do we take forward this action um, in our conversations virtually um, in the upcoming uh, days and weeks. Thank you everyone, have a wonderful evening and um, uh, until we meet soon, bye-bye. <laughs>